Okay, so we're going to go ahead and get started uh, looking at the books of poetry. Um, as always, as we're going, if you guys have questions about the books that we're in, make sure to ask it. Now, uh, the last time we, I guess it was probably three weeks ago now, uh, we had a lesson. Uh, I, I tried to simplify a question that was asked, and I, I feel like I kind of oversimplified, so we're just going to real quick look at it again in, in, in a certain way. And the question was about um, Esther being in the Bible, because I had, I had made the comment that Esther was not found in the Dead Sea Scrolls, but it was in the Masoretic Texts, and it got into kind of a question, so let me just kind of simplify things. Okay, first off, different Christian traditions have different books that they have in their Bible, that they have in their tradition. So, you know, the Catholics or, and the Eastern Orthodox, they'll include the Apocrypha, and some include other books, and so there's, di there's different areas of Christianity that are going to have different books. Here in the Assemblies of God, we're Protestant, uh, and we're, we're not really that much with the Eastern <laughs> at all. <laughs> so we have just the standard books in our Bible. We don't have a bunch of other ones in there. Uh, the, the reason why we don't have those other books comes down to basic question, and this is the root of the entire problem. Who decides if a book is biblical? Um, some people would answer the leader, such as the pope. Um, some people would answer tradition. Um, there's a lot of different answers that have been given. Where we get our books in, from the Old Testament um, was pretty much the same, as, in fact, it was the same as a Jewish council in the first century AD, if I'm remembering correctly, called the Council of Yamnia. Now, in that, they decided there were three different tests for whether a book should be in the Bible or not. The first test the first test, was it written by a prophet? So all the books in our Old Testament were books that they said, yes, they were written by a prophet. The second thing, was it written to all generations? It could not be specific to one situation that would not influence future generations. The third thing, it had to agree with previous revelation. So if there was a book that taught something that went against what the rest of Scripture said no to, it was not included. So the books that they landed on were the books that were already seen as Scripture. So the Council of Yamnia, Yamnia didn't decide the books in, in our Bible. They, they confirmed them. Um, the, canon, the canon had already been accepted for generations. Um, and, and when the books themselves were written, um, you had... Well, let me just say this. The other books... Um, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament that didn't make it, are books that are seen, were seen as they were obviously Christian, Christian books and that they were, they were written by God's people, in that case Jewish books, but they weren't seen as inspired, the Word of God. Um, so in the Masoretic texts, which were the old, previously the oldest texts of the Old Testament that we had, which was once again from the thousands A.D., those are the same books that we have in our Old Testament today, same books. When we found the Dead Sea Scrolls, they dated to before the time of Jesus, and they had all the books except for Esther, but they also had some other books in there as well. Um, it's not that, well, that's a conversation for another day. Um, as far as when the books were inspired, God did not possess the writers there's this idea that it's called, um, I think it's called verbal dictation theory, if I remember correctly. And the idea behind it is that God literally possess, not possess, that's a wrong word, but that's basically what it is, to make sure that people use every single word and it's just void of their character. But if you've ever translated the, uh, any of the Bible, really, you see that people's character definitely is there. Um, so I really don't think that's, a, that's an accurate way to look at it. And I really don't think the Bible teaches that either. God inspired them, but not every single word was forced by God. Just like when a prophecy is given. God gives the message, but like let's say, for instance, if a the is there, right? Like God doesn't really, I don't think, trips over that kind of stuff because what he wanted said is said. And so what we believe in the Assemblies of God is we believe in something called the plenary verbal view. What that means is that exactly what I just said. It's God's word, but it still has the writer's character in it. Make sense? 
And, and the, why this is important to note is because in our attempt to really get across that every word is the word of, of the Bible is the word of God, which is true, we've kind of made it too narrow because in translations you have to add words and take words away to make it into English. See what I mean? And, and then also there's the issue in in every word because yes, it is God's word, yes. But does that have to mean that, like, for instance, every the, God specifically said, but that word there. You see what I mean? Like, it can still be God's word fully and entirely without, while it still remain has humans mark, humanity's mark on it. Does that kind of make sense? And if you want more, more of this, uh, uh, this view, the plenary verbal view, um, I can actually point you to a couple of really good books. Uh, but the Sims of God has a paper on this um, on their website, ag.org. You can just go to their um, papers there. And you can kind of, and they probably say it a little bit better than I am, but you get what I'm saying. So Esther was, I, I guess I needed to add an addendum when, when we had last time. Esther was probably not in the Dead Sea Scrolls because we, we didn't find, we didn't recover all of the scrolls from the Dead Sea Scrolls. Some of them were lost. So hypothetically, Esther could have been it, uh, in it. Um, but the reason why Esther wasn't in there probably, um, if it was, if it wasn't, uh, was because it hadn't made its way to the West. Um, Esther was in the Septuagint though, which was written sometime around the 300s BC. So long story short, Esther does belong in the Bible. We just don't know why it wasn't in, in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, uh, and one last thing I wanted to mention before I drop this and probably never return to it again. In the Masoretic texts, this is where we get, um, the added vowels to Hebrew, because Hebrew did not have vowels. And it's also where we get the Hebrew accent marks, because Hebrew did not have accent marks. And it's also where we got uh, the notes on the text itself, uh, because they were trying to preserve it and add notes for clarification. Um, but it is the same books as our books of the Old Testament. So uh, for those who were here and actually cared about that question, there you go. If you weren't here, you don't care. Well, now it's just wasted time, I guess. <laughs> uh, moving on to what we're actually looking at tonight. Now, in the ancient Near East, we're looking at the books of poetry. Go to the next slide there, um, Darla. And the books of poetry, it's kind of weird because we call them the books of poetry, but they're actually more like the books of wisdom. I don't know really how you want to look at that. But in the ancient Near East, wisdom literature actually refers to magical skill. It does not refer to morality. Whereas in the Bible, wisdom literature does refer to to morality. In fact, Proverbs, one of its repeated refrains is the, the, how does it say it? It says it, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. That's how it says it. In, in the Bible, wisdom literature is very much so morality bound. And so it's a completely different uh, view, worldview from the ancient Near East. Another thing to mention about the ancient Near East, which is very, very relevant, there's other things to mention too. Um, such as writing styles and stuff, but that's just for people who care about literary arguments, and I don't think that's us. So, uh, anyways, uh, one of the big deals with the ancient Near East is they had this view that good inevitably leads to prosperity, and bad inevitably leads to suffering. So, if you were suffering, it meant because you were bad or you did something bad, um, which obviously is it should probably remind it probably will remind most of you about the story where. Jesus is with his disciples, and they say, hey, did this guy sin or did his parents sin? So that's, that, that was very much so a common, uh, a common belief. And so Job really tackles that, and it's probably the oldest book in the Old Testament, or oldest story at least. Uh, and so you have really uh, confronting the culture right there from the get-go. <clears throat> Go to the next slide. Which takes us to the book of Job. Now, as I mentioned, Job is probably the oldest story in the Bible, um, there, there are countless other cultures who have their own kind of version of Job. It's like the story, the story of the flood. Every culture that I'm aware of has their own account of the flood happening. To just discredit it as, oh, that didn't really happen. <laughs> You're going to have to explain how every single culture said that it did happen. Uh, generally, bad things happen to bad people. Okay, yeah, but good things happen to... Uh, and good things happen to good people, yeah, but... Not, that's not always true. I mean, you can say a lot of times that, that that can happen, but it's not always true. And I think we do this for a lot of reasons. We want to make sure that nothing bad is going to happen to us. And if, I do, if, I, if I'm good, then nothing bad will happen to me. And we kind of believe in this kind of um, Jack Karma view. And I think that it just kind of eases our conscience. As far as who wrote the book of Job, 
this, <laughs> this is a little more tricky than you think. Uh, anonymous. We really have no idea. Um, uh, we're, we're not even sure of when it was finished. So there's that. <laughs> it could have been in, in Isaiah's time. It could have been before Isaiah's time. It could have been after. So maybe the 900s, maybe. <laughs> as far as an outline, um, it, it's hard to give an outline uh, to Job without making it really long. So to give you just a basic outline, I've broken it up into three sections. Uh, there's the problem that develops in chapters 1 through 2. That's where Satan you know, brings us to, to God and everything is hunky-dory for Job, and it starts kind of falling apart. Then there's the second part, which is basically the debates. This is where Job will say something, and then his friends are going to c- correct him. <laughs> and then at the end of the debates, there's this young guy uh, who thinks he's going to fix all the old people's problems, and uh, Job doesn't even respond to the guy. <laughs> and the thing is, this is the funny bit, not even God responds to the guy. So I don't know if he was right or wrong. Nobody really even answers him. Uh, and then the, the end of the book is the conclusion. This is chapters 38 through 42, and God kind of, you know, he's been, the whole book, been asking for God to show up, and then God actually does show up and uh, answers him, and that goes. As far as the main theme of the book of Job, uh, why do righteous people suffer? Uh, that's pretty much suffer, uh, sums it up. Why do righteous people suffer? This is this is the a, the question of the ages. Seems like everybody's always asking this question. Job really looks at, looks at that, and it doesn't try to just downplay it and oversimplify it. I mean, it would be really easy to give just a real simplistic answer, but uh, if you found yourself in those times of suffering, I bet you that wouldn't have done you much good. Um, so, as far as when the conclusion of Job hits. Um, you have Job, show, I mean, God showing up like Job wanted him to, um, but it doesn't go how Job expects it to, and there's no really back and forth with, between Job. God says something, and then Job just kind of says, ah, my bad. And God says something else, and Job's like, never mind, I'm, I'm keeping quiet now. <laughs> and then, you know, uh, Job's fortunes are restored, but obviously his kids are still dead. He just has more kids, not that they're interchangeable. Um, and, you know, there are some interesting things there that happen. So Job still had to carry the weight of his burden for the rest of his life, which is kind of an important thing. Just because God shows up doesn't mean that you don't have scars, you know. Um, but in Job, we, uh, we see an exception to Proverbs. So Proverbs, and we're going to look at this in just a minute, Proverbs is basically, hey, this is how you should live your life. But Job is, the, the, uh, there's three books that are going to seem to contradict Proverbs. They're going to say, ah, but here's an exception. Job is the first one of those three books. And its exception is, yes, yes, okay, that's how you should live. Proverbs is right. But wisdom can't always explain things. Life has to be met with faith. No matter how much wisdom you have, at the end of the day, wisdom is not going to answer all of life's questions. It's not. It didn't for Job. It didn't for Job's friends. Wisdom couldn't figure it out. There's a point where, where wisdom ends and faith has to be there. Um, because, you know, being smart isn't good enough. Knowing a lot, being wise isn't good enough. So so what about Job? What does it matter that it made it into our Bible? What does it matter that we have it? What does it matter that we read it? Well, I think there's a lot of things, uh, but I think we can sim- sim- uh, simplify it like this. It teaches us to come with humility to the suffering of others. And also, I think for those of us who are suffering, it kind of teaches us, uh, you know, the, to take our... our, our our heaviness to God, which is something that the Psalms also teaches, which, surprise, surprise, that's where we're going next. As far as the Psalms, the Psalms have caused a lot, really a field day for atheists because they don't quite understand what Psalms are about, but they love to bring it up in arguments against God and the Bible and Christianity. So let's just kind of get this right from the get-go. Psalms are written from man's perspective to God not God's perspective to man. That's the biggest issue that atheists fail to understand. It's written from man to God. If you want from God to man, you want the prophets. But if you want from man to God, you want psalms. Those are two different categories of writings. Um, What the psalmist says isn't always right. Okay, I, I, want, I want you to get this. Just because a psalmist says it doesn't mean that it's right or wrong. It's an expression. Okay, so like a good example of this, Psalm 138. How I wish that somebody would take your children and dash them against the rocks. 
is that a right thing? <laughs> well, <laughs> it's not really right or wrong. It's just he is frustrated. He's taking his frustration to God. It is man reaching out to God. And yes, we have all thought stupid things before. We have all been in times of extreme pain and said things and prayed things we probably shouldn't have. That's kind of the idea of Psalms. <laughs> Uh, it's uh, another thing we see in, in Psalms is that it's not bad to play music in church. I mean, there's been a lot of Christians who kind of had a lot of uh, arguments in the past about, you know, whether music is, should be a thing in church or not. And I think Psalms kind of shows us, yeah. And another thing I think it tells, shows us about musicians is, is that musicians should have skill. You know, a lot of times uh, Christians, uh, not Christians, churches have uh, that really, really unfortunate person that just has zero skill but they have such a heart to do it, and they don't want to say no, and so they just let them go up there, and they sing their awkward song, and it's, and it's awkward. Uh, but I think Psalms definitely teaches us that musicians should have skill. You should have people on the staff and on the board and on the pastoral roles that have skill. You know what I mean? Uh, I haven't been quiet about this since I got here. If the situation comes where I am not the right person for the job, it's time for me to step down and get somebody else. You know what I mean? Like, right now, I know what I'm doing. I know how to lead the church forward. But if we start growing to a point where I don't know what to do next, I have serious questions whether I could take this church past two to 500 people. Serious questions whether I could do that. So if we get to that situation and I find out, no, I can't, it's time for me to step down and to get somebody else who can and is better with uh, functioning with high uh, numbers of, of people. And that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. You work at your skill level. You know what I mean? And so that's just something that we, I think we see in, in Psalms. As far as the authors of, of authors of Psalms, this is very neat because Psalms was written over a large span of time. It has Psalms by David, Asaph, the sons of Korah, Moses, Solomon, really spanning years of, of Israelite history. Um, as far as an outline, there really is no outline for Psalms. It's broken up into five books, but the five books have no major theme or chronology. It doesn't seem like there's any rhyme or reason that puts a psalm in one of the books over the other books. It just seems like they're random. And there's 150 chapters. Each chapter is a different song or psalm. And that's, I mean, that's basically it. It's, there's no way to really simplify that. As far as um, the, the content of the psalms, the psalms can be broken up into different styles. The first one is called a hymn. This is a really simple, uh, simple one. It's just a praise song. That's it. The second style is called penitential. This is where uh, the, the, the author, the, the psalmist, is expressing sorrow for sin. The third one is called wisdom. This is more of observational and, or instructional. So a good example of this is, I think it's like Psalm maybe 1, where he says, um, how blessed is the one who walks in the way of the Lord. That's, it's, it's a wisdom psalm. It's more of just giving instructions. Uh, the next one is called a royal psalm. Uh, this is where the focus is on the king. Now, this one is, is hard to, get, to not get confused because the next one, the messianic one, sometimes it seems like it's a royal one. Um, the Messianic one is one that has something to do with Jesus. But as you can guess, there's going to be a lot of overlap with Messianic style of Psalms and the other ones because sometimes um, it'll be talking about, um, you know, a royal psalm and it's talking about a king, but you realize that it actually is implying more than a human king could be. Or sometimes it'll be a penitential one, you know, expressing sorrow, and you'll see like a line or two in there that kind of reflects Jesus. So, I mean, so it's not so easily delineated as, as we would have hoped. Um, and then the next one is called an imprecatory. Now, this is a call for judgment. Um, I think Psalm 138 would probably fit under that one. Uh, and remember, these styles, the, breaking these down into, into patterns is just to help us uh, to understand the content of the psalm. If you don't remember these things, it's not like you're going to... Um, now I'd understand the Bible or something. The next one is called lament. It's just bemoaning a certain situation. And that there, I think that's about the easiest way to do it. As you can guess, a, a, a lament psalm and a penitential psalm can kind of sometimes um, be real similar. Um, and the imprecatory one can sometimes delve into uh, uh, lament. So there's a lot of overlap there. 
Um, but that should help you get kind of the basic idea of the Psalms. The Psalms can be very useful for prayer. Um, if you are in a place where you're stuck in your prayers, uh, reading through the Psalms and turning it into your own prayer instead of reading it, like praying it, that's something that can sometimes help you. Um, sometimes it can uh, help you kind of um, relating to the person writing the Psalm. It can kind of help you um, to reach out to God. Um, I know some people do that. Um, I don't really think that, that God cares so much as, as long as it comes from the heart. There's no, like, perfect prayer. There's no um, imperfect prayer. I think that, that what God's, God's looking for is just for people to come to him. Uh, as far as what else the Psalms are, they, they really are uh, they're really useful for encouragement uh, because they teach us that God hears and is okay to struggle. Because we see all throughout the Psalms, these people are really genuinely struggling. And I don't know about you guys, but I'm often there. <laughs> and uh, so it, 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 it's, it's something that definitely relates to us very strongly. Um, probably the most uh, easy to relate to in the Bible. Uh, like there's some, going to be some different books that, that are easy to relate to if you've been there, right? Like if, if you've had a lot of, uh, some people have had a really hard life. They're probably going to get more out of Job, you know. Uh, some people are really into like, you know, business and, 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 and you know, marketing and, and, and organization, that kind of stuff. They're just, they just eat Proverbs up. I mean, they just, you know. Uh, some people are in roles like pastoral and that kind of stuff. Well, books like Titus and, and Timothy they're going to have a lot for those kinds of people. Uh, and you get what I'm saying. Uh, not every psalm turns it around. That's something to kind of point out. Sometimes people think that every single psalm starts out with like this complaint to God and then turns it to a blessing in the end. That's just not true. Some of the psalms start on downers and they end on downers. Some of the psalms relay zero hope. So, I mean, that, this, is, this is okay. Well, remember, this is from man to God, crying out to God. The main idea is that we're trusting in God, we're, we're leaning into God, not that we have all the answers. As far as when it was written, this is wild, okay? Because it was written all the way from the 1400s B.C. to the 500s B.C. That's a huge amount of time to be written in. And the main theme, obviously, is praise, obviously. So what, what does it matter that, that we have psalms in our Bible? The psalms don't just teach us, they relate to us. This is extremely important um, because it teaches us, in, in relating to us, it teaches us truth about God and teaches us to take our struggles to God. Going back to Psalm 138 again, here's an exile. They've just witnessed their city being destroyed, their family slaughtered, everything that made them then, them then, them, them, gone. This is a very difficult time for them. So they take their complaint to God. Oh, I wish somebody would take their kids. So they, they took their, their pain and suffering instead of, Killing people, <laughs> instead of striking out against people that were annoying them, they took it to God, and that's really the, the model that we see from Scripture. We don't have to take it to people and vent to people. We have to take it to God. Because if you vent to people, they're going to get a bad attitude. But if we take it to God, God's not going to get a bad attitude, <laughs> and he can carry us through that. So that take, it takes us to Proverbs. Proverbs is a very, very interesting book. The older I get, the more I see that it is a book for all ages. Um, when I was younger, I thought it was for older people. When I got older, I thought it was for younger people. And now that I'm a little bit older still, I'm like, no, this this book is for everybody. Um, it's, 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 it's oftentimes misunderstood, though, so let's start with that. Proverbs are not promises. Proverbs are not promises. They are observations that are generally true. There's going to be some situations where that proverb doesn't necessarily apply. That's all right. There's going to be other ones where it does. So just hold your horses. Um, they are proven true over time. So gen generally speaking, follow the proverbs. It might not apply to every single situation, and you'll find those situations when you get there. The second thing about the proverbs, they are not commands of how things must be done. They are advice given from the role of a father of how things will work out better if you do it that way. So, I mean, for instance, this is not to co-sign on a loan. If you co-sign on a loan, is God's wrath going to be poured out on you? No, you might get yourself in a financial pickle, and then you'll have to trust God to get you out of it. It's wise for you to not do that, but God's not going to, like, put your name in the naughty list or something if you, if you do that. You're just going to have probably more problems. Um, there are a lot of comparisons to the ancient Near East, uh, one that I was thinking of that there's just really kind of neat to, to kind of read alongside of is it's an Egyptian um, book of, of Proverbs. I forget what it's called, though. It's something like the Council of 
Tahotep or I forget. I don't don't quote that name. It, I forget what it's called. I'll, I can look it up, though, if anybody wants to know. And when you're reading through Proverbs, one thing that might help is if you try to find the underlying principles of the different proverb. Like, okay, well, what is the idea behind this proverb? And you'll sometimes see it kind of repeated over and over again, just in different ways. Um, like, for instance, God loves honesty. Well, then you have a bunch of different proverbs that talk about not using dishonest scales. Well, we don't use scales anymore in our, in our cells, but you can still get the idea behind it, being an honest businessman. Okay, I can get that, not ripping people off. Um, another thing that sometimes helps is when you're reading it and you, and you read the word king, switch that word king to a different word like president, pastor, or boss, and it might help you to apply it to the situation you're in. Um, so a good example of this is um, I had a, was kind of having a little bit of a struggle with a certain leader. Um, I don't want to really get too much into detail so you kind of get what I'm saying here. But I was reading one of the Proverbs, and it said something about a king that really related to the, to the situation. So I just switched the word king to what that leader, insert leader's name, and I, it really helped me get over that situation. But if you leave it as king in your head sometimes, you kind of think, oh, this is outdated and I don't need it for today. And, and so it's just a little tool that I use to help me apply it to today. If it doesn't work for you, it doesn't work for you. Um, one complaint that I think is kind of ridiculous that is leveled against Proverbs is that it's sexist. It's definitely not sexist, and I'll explain what I mean in just a second. The entire book deals with men and what to look for in a man. There's only one chapter that, that, that talks about a woman. Sometimes people think, oh, women have all... Uh, it it's, holds women to this high standard. It's like, hold on, hold on. It just got done for 30 chapters talking about what a man ought to do. So let's maybe cool it with that. Uh, so that takes us to a, a concept that I think is misunderstood largely by non-Christians, and that's the fear of the Lord. Sometimes there's this idea that fear of the Lord is only where you're sitting there like, Ooh, I'm scared of him, right? And definitely there, there is a certain element where when you're face-to-face -face with God, that is a fearful thing, absolutely. But the fear of the Lord is basically consideration of the Lord. And I know that that's an oversimplification, but it, it helps you understand it. Why do you do what you do? Who do you answer to? If you have the fear of the Lord, when you do things, you're going to do with the knowledge that God is watching you. So you, why do I do the right thing? Because I have the fear of the Lord, and God has taught me his ways. Do you know what I mean? Does that kind of help you see what, what I'm getting at here? Um, some say they believe God, but they live their, li their lives for themselves. They don't have the fear of the Lord. Um, to live in the fear of the Lord is to live with consideration of the next life, and if God is pleased with you, knowing he punishes the guilty. I mean, that's, that's a real simple way of doing that. Unfortunately, it's not really a sufficient way, so I'm just going to have to leave it there and say that the fear of the Lord is something that I think you have to learn in stages. So if you don't know it, uh, keep studying, and God will reveal it to you gradually. And if you don't know it, well, then this conversation isn't really that necessary anyways. As far as an outline, we can really break it down into three sections. But these, I find that this breakdown doesn't really help too much. Uh, my own opinion. Chapters 1 through 9 are basically lessons. Um, it, it's given more from the fatherly tone. Uh, chapters 10 through 29 are more like just general proverbs. They, they aren't always connected, but there are oftentimes themes when they're broken down into it. Whereas in chapters 1 through 9, the themes are more prominent. Like everybody knows um, Proverbs 3 where it says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understandings. But we just kind of for, forget that there's other verses around that verse. And those verses are very much so connected. Read all of chapter 3 because it all very much so is connected in, in its theme and what it's talking about. And then the third section of, of Proverbs is basically sayings. There's the sayings of Lemur and the different people, and it takes to the, to the um, woman of character and all these different things. And that's the last two chapters. As far as the author, <laughs> this is a little bit complicated. It's mostly Solomon, but there's some, also, some others that, that wrote some as well. Um, as I mentioned, there's uh, another king that wrote a section at the end and whatnot. And then there's a, a, actually quite a lengthy bit of the Proverbs that, was, that were added by King Hezekiah um, that he collected from Solomon and added later. Um, this is by the Bibles. I'm not like adding something in. The Bible admits to this. So Solomon had an original collection, and then Hezekiah took that, and he expanded on it later. And then some other things from other people were added in as well. Um, as far as when it was written, the final form that we have today was probably put together in the 700s or shortly after that. 
maybe 700s to the 500s, maybe somewhere in there. Uh, the main theme of the book, Principles of Living. This is the basics of do this. Um, so what, what does it matter that Proverbs is in our Bible? There are many important lessons for all ages that are really timeless. And I do have to say, James, the book of James in the New Testament has been called the New Testament book of Proverbs. But I don't think that that's fair because I don't think that Proverbs has any other books that are like it. It's like Psalms. It's one of a kind. Um, and the, really, the Bible in a, as a whole has a lot of books that are one of a kind. But I mean, here's a good, here's a good thing of what I'm trying to say. So you have the books of prophets. There's four major prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, uh, Daniel, and Ezekiel. And they're all the same kind of general style. Daniel is probably the oddball out there, but I mean they're all the basic, same basic style of prophecy. Uh, whereas Proverbs, what other book do we really have that has that much just general advice for life? Well, we really don't. I mean, Genesis more has stories that teaches about morality. Leviticus has laws that teaches about morality. You know, these kinds of things. And so that takes us <clears throat> to the book of Ecclesiastes. And before we get there, I want to stop, take a deep breath. Any questions so far? Okay. Um, Ecclesiastes is the second of the exceptions to Proverbs. I would say, I would call Ecclesiastes a book for midlife crisis. <laughs> uh, I think... I think that's fair. It's a book for a midlife crisis. And when you know Solomon's story, it kind of makes sense. So Solomon used to have it going on, you know, with God and stuff. But he kind of made compromises, a lot of compromises. And so he kind of walked himself into problems that he didn't have to have um, and, and struggled a lot for it. And we, we read Ecclesiastes, and we have to ask a question. Did he bounce back? Because the book of Ecclesiastes seems to imply at the end that he had learned something from this soul searching that he had done. That somehow, at the end of the book, maybe he fixed his relationship with God. Kings doesn't really tell us that. Uh, and Chronicles kind of leaves it kind of vague where it's possible. Uh, but we really don't know. And Ecclesiastes brings up the idea that maybe he did learn something and came back. Who knows? Um but what we see in Ecclesiastes is that life is incapable of satisfying us. It doesn't matter how good or how bad your life is, it is incapable. It, and my mom used to say this thing um, that really got me thinking. She, she used to say, I just wish that all the problems would go away. And I started thinking about how, um, how a lot of people just want to go off to an island somewhere, just be left alone. You know, but that's not ever going to satisfy us. And how do I know that? Because life cannot satisfy that, uh, can't satisfy us. It doesn't matter how good or how bad your life is. It's, it's never going to satisfy. Even if everything works out and we never struggle, it's still not going to satisfy us. Um, and another thing I think we see from Ecclesiastes is to get past your vocation. You know, there's a lot of kids nowadays that are trying to find their perfect job to make them happy. Well, jobs aren't going to make you happy. And you can see that from Ecclesiastes. Uh, he talks about, hey, you know, enjoy your work, but, uh, <laughs> you know, it's not, it's not going to solve the problem. Uh, I, for instance, am not a pastor. I'm a person who pastors. You know, there's a person past the vocation. And I think God expects that from us, that we should be getting past our vocation. Um, it, it, w when we get to heaven, he's not going to say, well done, good and faithful pastor, or, well done, good and faithful worship leader, or whatever else. He's going to say, well done, good and faithful servant. I mean, that there's a person behind the vocation, and that's really the heart of the person that God, um, you know, is, is calling to himself. And I think Ecclesiastes really delves into this. It goes through all the things that people hide in. You know, success, for instance, uh, a good life. All, you go through Ecclesiastes, it goes through all the different things. And he basically goes through them one by one and says, that's not going to make you happy. That's not going to make you happy. And at the very end, he finally gives us an idea of what's going to make us happy. So uh, it, I, one thing that you can kind of see throughout Scripture is that God comes to us on our terms. And let me kind of explain what I mean by that. At the time that the law was given... The old, the, those old cultures had their laws that they said were from the gods. So what did God do to make his purposes known to people? He spoke to them on the area that, that they would understand that. See what I mean? Gave them a law. Uh, the books of Proverbs, the, the books of, of, of poetry. These were not new ideas. The cultures around the Israelites had been doing this long before the, the Jews did it. But God 
use something that was familiar to them to teach them something. The Egyptians had their book of Proverbs, so God gave them his book of Proverbs. See what I mean? God, all throughout Scripture, it comes to people on terms where they will get it. To the wise, he brings books like Proverbs to speak to them. To people who aren't, you know, they're just more emotional, he, he has books like Psalms that speak to them. See what I mean? And it's, it's not necessarily right or wrong. What I'm trying to get at here is different books are going to speak to you at different times in life in different ways. And no matter where you are at intellectually or emotionally or whatever, there's going to be a book of the Bible that really speaks to you. And God just has a way of really speaking to us on our terms. For the smart people, he comes, you know, with wisdom. For, for Well, I shouldn't say that because there's a lot of times where God will kind of bring foolishness to the wise and just really confound them and confuse them. So I shouldn't say that. But <laughs> as we are seeking God and seeking to grow, he has a way of speaking to us in a way that we understand. And that's what I'm trying to get at. Um, but anyways, as far as who wrote Ecclesiastes, this is where it gets uh, not as neat as I would like, and I'll just leave it at that. It's possibly Solomon, but, I mean, it's traditionally been ascribed to Solomon, but it's really unclarified. Ecclesiastes never actually says, it, it says the preacher and stuff, and it gives a different gives things like that, but it says one thing that really makes this confusing. He, it, he says, whoever wrote Ecclesiastes, he says this, he says, I surpassed all who were on the throne before me. Well, if it was Solomon, the only people on the throne before him were David and Saul. <laughs> like, that's not, not really that big of an achievement, you know, and it makes it sound like there's all these people that he surpassed, and it just kind of, it's really kind of confusing. Um, and so we're left with, we don't know. We don't know who wrote it. The book never actually says, it never uses the person's name. It just says, you know, the preacher or how it's translated in different ways, but that's basically the idea there. Uh, when was it written? Oh, well, it's hard to know that since we don't actually know who wrote it. Uh, we can say maybe the 1,000s to the 300s, somewhere in that period there. But that's 700 years of history. <laughs> like that's not exactly the most, uh, you know, uh, easy to figure out. Uh, as far as an outline, I, I don't want to give an outline because it's not, it's not really like that. It's more... I, there's some books that I haven't given outlines on because I don't think I think that kind of holds the book back, and I think this is one of them. Ecclesiastes is a, is a search for meaning. It goes from money to work to religion, and it it goes through all the men and criticizes them, and then it ends on basically y'all need Jesus. <laughs> you know that's that's kind of where it ends. And uh, so an outline, well, it, it's breaking down all the things that we like to hide in. Uh, a main theme, we could move to that maybe. Uh, the main theme of Ecclesiastes is, is what is the meaning of life? And how many people do you hear asking that? I mean, goodness, it's like, it seems like there's every other week there's some kid that's asking, why am I here? What's the meaning of life? So with Ecclesiastes, we have the second exception to the book of Proverbs. Now remember, Proverbs told us this is how you should live. But Ecclesi Ecclesiastes tells us almost almost a contradiction. It's like, hey, hold on. Okay, yeah, that's great. Wisdom is great and everything. But wisdom cannot bring happiness or your fulfillment. No matter how wise you are, you will never be fulfilled. And, I mean, that's a little bit daunting uh, to those of us who, who love learning and books and we always try to accumulate more knowledge and stuff. Eh, that's not going to be enough. So what? What does it matter that we have Ecclesiastes in our Bible? Well, once again, there's a lot of different things I could say. But let's just keep it simple. First, uh, well, we all go through periods of grappling with doubt. Everybody goes through periods of grappling with doubt. That doesn't make you non-Christian. It makes you human. What you do when you're in times of doubt is really what the Bible talks about. Okay? You take it to God. You trust in Him. Uh, Ecclesiastes definitely encourages us not to give up. I think that that's a real good um, summary of that. And the last book to look at is Song of Solomon's, or uh, sorry, I'm sorry, Song of Songs, or also Song of Solomon. However, you want to look at it. Um, different Bibles have a different way. The idea behind Song of Songs is is it's just basically a phrase that means the best of songs. Um, so I mean, you you take that however you want it. Um, it is an uncomfortable book about love. <laughs> Uh, very much so awkward to read around the campfire. Maybe not read it with kids. <laughs> um, the, it, it, the, people a lot of times have a problem with this being a book about uh, love because they don't want any of the books of the Bible to be limited by context. And to that, I would say that that's a, I see what you're trying to get out, but every book of the Bible is limited by context. 
Take, for instance, the book, the, the, the letter to, to the Corinthians. You have a church that, that ha- is having complete chaos. They have no rules, and everybody's just going off into mysticalism and spiritual experiences. That's the context of, Cor- of, Col- of Corinthians, so Corinth. But then you read the book of Colossae, or Colossians, and it has m- more of issues. They're dealing with core doctrinal beliefs about who Jesus is and how that applies to how we should live our life. Completely different context from the book of Corinthians. So every different book in the Bible has a different context. To then say Song of Solomon shouldn't is a little bit, I think, not really fair. Um, Song of Songs doesn't have much if you aren't married. It's just one of those books that isn't going to speak to you too much. Um, Timothy has more for pastors. Psalms has more for people who are suffering, and so does Job. Um, if you are a person who's doing the right thing and still getting punished for it, Peter's going to have more to say to you there. Uh, I mean, the, it, it, that's just the way the Bible is. Hebrews has a lot more for Christians who aren't growing. It also has a lot more for, for Christians uh, who have a Jewish background. That's the context of the book. And uh, so there's going to be different books at different times in your life that speak to you on a stronger level. Uh, that's not something that makes it any less the Word of God. That's just something that makes it more specific for the different situations you're in. So uh, the biggest thing about about Song of Songs to remember is it's not an allegory. A lot of times it's just kind of dismissed and turned into this allegory where, where the different things are stand for either Jesus or Israel or God and so on and so forth. We can actually compare it to other books uh, of the time. It claims to be a song. It, it, it's written as a song. It... It has the same format as uh, as the other books of the time that, that are like that. I mean, just it, you'd really be hard pressed to say that it's an allegory. And I know there was a period in, in Christian history, about the thousands A.D. and around there, before and after, uh, where it was largely only looked at as allegory. And the reason for it being because sex was a big no-no that the church should never be talking about. Even though the Bible talks about it in numerous places throughout, it was, no, 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 we can't possibly be talking about that because there's no way that God would talk about such an unholy thing. But God is the one who created sex. He's the one who designed the whole thing. Like, it, I think that he can handle it. I don't think that he gets as grossed out as we do about stuff. I was actually joking with somebody the other day. Uh, we were talking about fantasy, and it, uh, there was a book, and we were talking about different things in it, you know, from, um, what was it called? Uh, we're incestuality and seances and all these different things. And uh, the guy, uh, my friend leaves over and he says, oh, you're talking about the Bible? <laughs> because the Bible has a lot of stuff that, w- if the Bible was a book of fantasy, we would never read it. Because it doesn't meet our standards of what the kind of books we should be reading. You know what I mean? Like, if, if we're burning Harry Potter, for instance, just imagine how much we'd burn the Bible. It's a good thing that it's God's word because (laughs) that's, I think, the thing where we don't burn it. And it deals with a lot of things that we don't really like thinking about and talking about. And I think that's all the more proof that it is God's word because naturally I think there's going to be things that we shy away from and things that we want the Bible to talk about. But there's a lot of people in the atheist movement, for for instance, that think that the New Testament was written long afterwards. But this is, this is actually one of the reasons why I don't think so, is because it doesn't deal with problems that the, first, that the second century A.D. Christians were dealing with. It deals with problems that the first generation of Christians were dealing with. If it was written, written afterwards, they would have made it apply to the things that they were dealing with. Makes sense, doesn't it? And uh, so what we see in the Bible is a lot of uniqueness that really deals with a lot of things that are sometimes hard, and Song of Solomon is one of them. Um, what else? Oh, there is a point that I always love making when we're talking about Song of, Sol- Song of Solomon. If you're going to say that Song of Solomon is an allegory, that's fine. You can hold that view. That's fine. But if you're going to, it's very important to remember that God is not the lily of the valley. I know we've heard it in, this, in the hymn for countless years. He's the lily of the valley. No, he's not. She, she is the lily of the valley. Uh, a lily of the valley is a, is a common weed. It's a common weed. That, uh, calling Jesus the lily of the valley makes no sense. Okay? In Song of Songs, the woman is talking, and she says, I am the lily of the valley, to which Solomon then replies, no, 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 no. You are like one in a million. Calling Jesus the lily of the valley doesn't make any sense. So anyways, that's just my little rant. I've gotten over it. We're moving on now. As far as who wrote it, uh, who wrote Song of Songs, 
we don't really know. And I know that sounds funny because we call it Song of Solomon, but that doesn't actually mean that he wrote it. It doesn't say that he wrote it. Uh, it could have actually been written for Solomon. It could be either way. And it leaves a little bit of a problem for us. Either way, that leaves the date of writing sometime around the 900s, probably. So BC, obviously. Um, as far as an outline, uh, relationships maturing through marriage and afterwards. At the beginning, they're just kind of like lovers, and they get like kind of things turn into marriage. And then at the end of the book, you have them. They've been married a while, and things aren't necessarily going smoothly. Uh, one of my favorite lines of the book, though, is uh, I forget who says it, she or him, or maybe it's the chorus that sings it, but they say, watch out for the foxes. And what they're talking about are the little things that creep up in your marriage that bring destruction. It's usually not big things that lead to divorce. It's usually a bunch, a bunch of little things that chew away at your marriage. And uh, I really like that line. But anyways, uh, what else? Um, the main theme of the book, the joy of love. And in Song of Songs, we have the third of the three exceptions to Proverbs. Remember, Proverbs, this is how you should live your life. It told us this is the kind of person you should marry. It told us that all throughout the book. Well, in Song of Songs, we see irrational love. And love is oftentimes irrational. Don't you remember when you were younger? <laughs> Don't you remember when your kids got to that age and they thought that they knew best? They thought that they didn't need your advice and, you know, all this different stuff. And they go off with somebody and then, you know, they, they come back and they have their first quarrel. And you're like, oh. Yeah. Uh, so what? What does it matter that Song of Solomon is in our Bible? Well, I, I think it has a lot to say, but marriage is a gift. I think that's one of the things that it shows us. It is holy. I think that it shows us that. It's precious and pleasing. I think it shows us that. And there's nothing wrong with sex in the constraints of marriage. In our culture, there's nothing wrong with sex anywhere. Uh, in the Middle East, for instance, it is, it is very common uh, in the Arab world's um, Muslim people, for instance, uh, it's a common practice to have relations with uh, donkeys uh, before you, when you're young, too young to marry. It's a common practice. When Napoleon Bonaparte uh, invaded Egypt, um, they actually, the Arabs had a big problem because the French people wanted to mess around with their wives with the Egyptian women. And the Egyptians were confused because they thought, why don't you just mess around with these Egyptian boys? Because the Islam people would have relations with these young boys as extramarital, you know, things. And so they were confused as to why the French were doing that. And so, you know, our cultures always have these crazy ideas of who we can and can't have sex with. And God gives us really good guidelines. Then he says, hey, sex is good in those constraints, you know, so we're not supposed to have free love everywhere, uh, which I think we learned in the 70s. I hope we learned in the 70s. Uh, without Song of Songs, we wouldn't be, we wouldn't have as strong a support uh, for a healthy sex life and marriage it is often turned evil by well-meaning religious people. That's just going to happen, though. There's a lot of times people mean well, and they really, you know, turn the Bible to kind of bad things. But uh, ancient world often had sex as nothing more than procreation or pagan worship or immorality. Uh, in the ancient world, for instance, it was very common for you at the har uh, not the harvest time, um, before the planting season, uh, to go to the temple and have relations with the, uh, with the cult uh, prostitutes. And the idea was that it would bring fertility from the gods. And so that was, the, that was their context for, for sex. Or it was just for procreation, nothing else. Uh, or it was just uh, something that you did for, like, flings, you know, like, uh, it was okay for me to cheat on my wife, for instance. Um, and in, in the Bible we see, okay, this is an outline, but it's not just rules. It's also in Song of Solomon, hey, it's a good thing, too. So uh, that's all I want to say today about this. We'll end there. Um, so next, next week we'll pick up with the books of the prophets. We'll talk, with, we'll talk about the prophets. And it's not going to be as in-depth uh, with prophets because we can't break the four big ones down too much. Um, Isaiah, for instance, it's just too long to really break down into outlines and stuff. So we're going to have to talk very broadly about them. Any questions about any of these uh, one? Two, three, four, five books? I think it was five books. Any questions? No? We're good? Okay. Thanks for coming, guys. Lord, we thank you for your word. Uh, help us to always stay, uh, stay in it and keep reading it. And to help us never to have that attitude in us 
that uh, we, we, we know it all, that, we, that we've read the Bible so many times, that we know everything that's in there. Help us to always come to it with fresh eyes and with a hungry heart, uh, that we would encounter your word uh, and encounter you in your word. We love you, Lord. Amen.